Hi, and welcome to Be More Super. I'm your host, Brian, and as always, we've got a great guest this week. We've got the wonderful Alex Ponovic, uh, the star of Van Helsing, and the new, well, I'm sure it's going to be a hit show from TNT, Snowpiercer. Yes, yeah, Snowpiercer is going to be premiering on Netflix this Monday, uh, so check it out. If you're a fan of the books or the original movie with Chris Evans, this new show starring Jennifer Connelly, Sean Bean, uh, Stephen Ogg, uh, it's going to be an amazing, amazing show, so check it out on Netflix. And as always, our show is brought to you by the wonderful people at Prop Store of London. So check out their website, propstore.com, because uh, currently they've still got the payment plan going, so if you're After a screen use prop or costume from your favourite movie or TV show, check them out, propstore.com. So sit back, relax and enjoy our interview with Alex Ponovic. Welcome to Be More Super, the podcast. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. An action-packed podcast where we'll discuss all things entertainment. You're the answer to our real life. Conventions, prop collecting, cosplay, interviews, reviews, and so much more. The show starts with host Brian Gardner right now. There we go. Yeah. Yes. Technology nice. will not beat us. <laughs> How are you, Brian? You know what? I I am doing fine. I am surviving. Uh, thank you so much for coming on to the show. Um, for all the UK listeners and the US listeners, because believe it or not, about forty percent of my listeners are UK based. The rest are in the US, um, Argentina, Chile, Sweden. You name it, all over the world. It is crazy. The power of podcasts. Is awesome. My God. It is really, really good. So, Alex, thank you so much for coming on to the show. I'm really excited, um, only because uh, we'll talk a bit bit later about your new show on Netflix. Uh, being in England, um, everything's slightly delayed, but on the 25th, so on Monday on Netflix, we've got Snowpiercer. Yeah, Canada and the U.S. get it on the 25th. So the world gets it on the 25th, except for the U.S., which started it on the 17th on TNT. So everyone's, you know, if you don't have TNT, the whole world can be able to see it on the 25th. (laughs) So in all fairness, I'm trying to avoid any spoilers, anything on the Internet, because you know what? I want to watch it, you know, with fresh eyes. Uh, and experience it firsthand. So uh, before we get into all of that exciting stuff, you know, reading up about you, it's really interesting. I mean, you used to be a boxer. You used to be a musician. Let's let's talk about your boxing, because I'm a massive boxing fan. I used to box myself. Um, nice. Only I literally I'm- just came... I just came from training. Like, I walked in the door and started setting everything up, so I'm still, like, a little sweaty and stuff, but... um. Yeah, so yeah, boxing this thing, and you're a big boxing fan. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, I mean, to, uh, I, I was interviewing uh, Jack O'Halloran, you know, that played Non in Superman, you know, the original Superman, and he was a, yeah. a championship boxer as well back in the day. He boxed Foreman and pe- pe- you know boxers like, like like that, which is absolutely awesome. Um, yeah. And the boxing club that I used to box for, um, they ended up making a film about it. Um, called 24-7 and um, James Corden uh, which is big in the States played me in the film so yeah it's really odd I, I, to be honest awesome. I had an audition for it but I never went to it uh, because I went to, to college and university for perform, performing arts myself so. so so wait a second so you had an audition to play you Yes, basically. Uh, Shane, That's Shane, awesome. Shane Meadows uh, directed it, and he's directed quite a few films in the UK. But yeah, boxing has always been a passion uh, for mine because, um, you know, I, I got bullied a lot when I was a kid, um, and my dad uh, chucked me into boxing. Um, the first boxing club I went to was Phoenix Amateur Boxing Club, where Cole Froch, um, you know, the world champ, champ, champion came totally. from. Totally. That, um, that fight with... Uh, 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 Taylor was one of the most epic comebacks I've ever seen. Yeah, yeah. And to be honest, he, he's, he's still well renowned in in the Midlands where I'm from. Um, but yeah, so what got you into boxing? Well, it's it's easy, man. I had three generations of boxers in my family. So yeah. my grandfather, my uncle, 
my dad. It was all passed down. So I, I, I think that was the first thing I learned how to do was throw a jab, like right when I, when I like at like two weeks old, because uh, <laughs> my my dad was you know a champion boxer in the old Yugoslavia, and so was my uncle. And uh, when they moved to immigrated to Canada, they had to you know make a new life. But for me, my my dad was always, you know, teaching me boxing, watching boxing, and I just absolutely fell in love with the sport. I never fell in love with the, like, at the end result is you you hurt your end you you end up hurting somebody and breaking them breaking them down physically, yeah, uh, and mentally. I love the aspect of the chess game. It was never about like how hard, how how much I could hurt the other person. It was always about. You you threw that jab and I slipped and I connected with this and then you came around and I like it, it's the mechanics and the science of it. Yeah, that's what I love. the footwork, the distance, the relaxing. If you're all tight, you're not your gas is going to be gone. If you're relaxed in a pressure situation, all of that stuff. I love the art of boxing. Yeah. And so that's what ke- really kept me kept me in it. And obviously, I'm a Muhammad Ali fan, and and looked up to someone like that. And, I, and I'm not the only one, but looked up to somebody like that in in a in a state where you know you're you're in a sport where it's just you, and you could get beat up like that. And and, and to have such a voice of of um, of self self worth for what he believed in um, and gave up three years of his, of his boxing life yeah. um, to, for, for a point that he wanted to prove is, is, and he was never going to go to Vietnam. They were going to get him to do exhibition matches and stuff. And that, but that's about it. Just morale, but it, he, he didn't believe in it. So that kind of stuff connected with boxing was a huge part. And I got, I had the chance to meet the man. That was oh. amazing. Did did you get to meet him um, late later in his life? Because I, yes, I I I met him in the nineties uh, when he came over oh. to the UK for a book signing, and he just had a baby. Um, but to see the you know the state that he was hit in with the Parkinson was just was just you know shocking. It was just so heartbreaking to see this great man that was not only a boxer, he was a poet. He was. You know, it was just amazing all round. Yeah. And, and to see him, you know, become, you know, the man. Well, he was street, still a great man, but it was heartbreaking to see. Yeah. I mean, the, the physical body was breaking down, but his mentality oh, was quite yeah. sharp. But what was interesting is that, and you'll attest to this, is that when we're younger and we see fight fighters like him where he basically had two careers he had the career of no one can hit him and then after his three year layoff he had the career of he can take a shot yeah. like he took shots and so you in like Gore, uh, Gotti and Ward that type of fight where you see these guys going in the trenches and they're it's more of their will than their physicality and then when you get older like I don't know how old you are, but I'm 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 50. So when I got older, I got to really go and see people. Like I have a few friends that are a little little punch drunk, you know, is the, is the uh, simple term for it. Um, that I kind of go, man, I cheered for that. I <laughs> when I was younger, I didn't know what it was what it would actually do. Yeah. So when you when you think back of like I cheered for those fights so hard and. And, and the physical damage that they will take in the long run, it, it's a weird little feeling inside, you know, that that you were, you know, championing that in the moment. And then when you see the repercussions, you're like, oh, man, I would rather have them have a conversation with me yeah. than, than go through go through those wars. I thought for a moment earlier on you was going to come out with a Rocky quote. You know, it's, it's, <laughs> it's not how hard you can hit, it's how hard you can get hit and keep moving get forward. It, and keep getting it, yeah. yeah. Which, which is great because as a kid, uh, when I started boxing, Rocky to me was just the film. I mean, I remember <laughs> I went to Philadelphia. I, w- I was in Washington, D.C. And um, I-, I convinced family at the time to drive me all the way to Philly so I can run up the steps. Um, you know, and obviously the statue had changed position, but it's just the you, them films are just awesome. It's like the underdog story. It's a bit like Snowpiercer, I suppose, uh, which which we'll right. talk about later on. But um, but yeah, I mean, what what made you change then from from boxing into acting? What you know, what sparked that? Yeah, well, I play. I for like even though I grew up with boxing, I never really competed, and you know that had a lot to do with you know when you're a young kid and in your early teens, 
you know, you want to get as far as away from your parents as possible. And for me, my dad and I usually butted heads. So I, I just happened to fall into playing music. So I would play music and then there would be times, you know, every time I wanted to go to the boxing gym or something, my dad wanted to come and there was always a strife. Yeah. So, and then when I was on the road with my band, my band was basically going, look, if you break your hand, that means we're out of a job too. So, you know, maybe you shouldn't. And I couldn't help it. So I would always sneak out and go to the gym and go box and come back and pretend I just went to go lift weights. So it was always a part of my blood and I always needed it. And then as time went on, I think it's, you know, I, I, I started later in my life, even though I boxed my whole life competitively, I started boxing later to, to actually bridge the bond between my father and I so we could get a little tighter. And it worked. And we got to go to a bunch of tournament, tournaments. I, I won a bunch of tournaments. And, um, and I, it, was really, it was really interesting seeing that. But I have so much respect for the sport. I didn't want to give it my everything. I didn't think I could do, um, you know, playing in the band and competing at a very high level. And, it, it, and I also looked at it as, you know, I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to put it all in one basket. Yeah. I love the sport as a spectator, as a working out aspect. And I love competing. Um, but to take it to the next level, I, I just have too much respect for the sport to to um to go in and half assed yeah. and then boxing came or sorry and then acting came and it was something that um i really saw the the the, the equal levels of for for instance like I, I remember doing my first play and i got into acting late also so i i was doing my first play and i was super nervous 300 people in in the in the auditorium and i went oh my god i know exactly this feeling this is right before a fight. So I, I did some shadow boxing. I started like learning my, uh, like saying my lines to relax. And it just like boxing paralleled that in, you have to be relaxed. The more relaxed you are, the more present your mind is, the more present your physical body is. And, and doing that led me into acting and, and really fell in love with it that way. I considered that to be my, yeah. You know my, my non-physical boxing career, if that makes any sense. <laughs> and what do you think of uh, Mike Tyson coming back, making a comeback? Yeah, I'm, here's what I'm a fan of. I, I'm a fan of Mike Tyson Holyfield having the rematch. Oh, I'm not a I'm not a fan is. of. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But I'm not a fan of him making a comeback and fighting like a younger dude. I just yeah. think it it's just it's just. You know, just go out and be done. But if it's those two old guys coming in and doing like a five rounder, it would be really interesting to watch. <laughs> well, let's well let's talk about your acting career because you've been in literally near enough everything. By the way, this is the best. This is the best start of a video that I've ever had. Is talking about boxing. Like that. That's awesome. <laughs> That's good to hear. That is good to hear. Um, so you're acting. You've done so much. You've been so so busy. How do you keep so busy? What's your secret as an actor to to be always working? Uh, man, I'm just. <sighs> I'm just really lucky that I have a, uh, 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 there's a lot of great people around me and there, and I try to put myself in situations where, you know, I can work with people and I've just been extremely fortunate to work with some amazing people and then, and then finding other projects to work with them again. Um, I don't know, man, I just feel like I'm extremely fortunate and, and, and I've, I've been hap uh, lucky enough to have all the opportunities to fight fall into the right spot so i've just been really fortunate yeah i mean what one of the films i actually love is war for the planet of the apes i think it's great because you know they could simply just cgi you know the animals but the fact that they got you guys um you know with all your dots and everything like that and but you acted i mean you went to ape camp for a month um I know how hard it is to act like a, an ape because it, I had to do physical theatre and we had to do workshops on how to, you know, the mannerisms of apes, how to walk, how to make the sounds. I mean, uh, you know, what was your experience like on that film, um, you know, going from where you've been to, you know, all that physical work in the way of embodied in, in, embodying, um, you know, an ape? Yeah, what, what's interesting is that when we started ape camp it wasn't about the physicality right. that first 
I think it was like the first week was literally all the actors sitting in a circle, uh, being being led by um, I, his name is escaping me right now, which sucks because he's an amazing he was an amazing teacher and actor, um, but, but he led us through an emotionality exercise before we would embody the 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 bot uh, embody the ape, and because there is no insecurity in a primate. So we all as humans have our little insecurities, yeah. you know, especially when you're being watched, you, you tighten your stomach up a little bit, you maybe have a different gait. Um, and so it was all about letting everything go, letting all your insecurities go and breathing with your diaphragm so your body can get the whole physical aspect of no insecurity. And so that's where we started. And it was emotional for a lot of people because you're literally letting all your guard down and guards that you don't even know you have. It's just as as you build yourself through life, you build up these little things, these security things. So that was beautiful when we got to kind of strip away the insecurity and start start the um, start the process of the physicality at at ground level. So that to me was one of the best things, and that whole film was a, an acting class because yeah. it helped my acting so much to really go through that and embody the primate in a way that I never even thought would be possible. And th I think that's why you saw some great performance in Andy Circus. Come on. Like, <laughs> it's Andy Circus. I mean, physically on, on, on your body though, because you know, you, you're using the half false arms and you're arching your back. Did you get any injuries or anything like that? Did you get any aches and pains from it? Always. Cause yeah. you're using muscles you never used before. Yeah. You know, so we, we like, like I, I work, I, I work out the, almost like the same muscles when you're boxing, but what we were asked to do, it definitely was a lot of people were sore. A lot of people had, had, uh, you know, I remember going to massages twice a week just to <laughs> kind of loosen everything up, but yeah, it was, it was, it was difficult. That's for sure. But, um, everyone took to it, man. It was pretty awesome. It is an awesome movie. I'm still trying to convince my wife to watch it because oh, it's so beautiful. It's such a beautiful <laughs> trilogy too. To 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 be fair, she doesn't like the movies because there's something about talking apes that that <laughs> that, 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 that freaks her out, and so she won't watch any of the ape movies or any films with Arnold Schwarzenegger in it because she doesn't like his voice. <laughs> so you know, I've got to watch them all by myself. Oh um, my God, that's hilarious! <laughs> and then, that's and, and, and then we move on to Van Helsing. You know, you've got such a fan base for Van, El Van Helsing; it's crazy. Um, I mean, I had one of your super fans, uh, Katie Lester. Uh, Katie Lester, yes. yeah, contact me. Say, look, you've got to interview Alex. You've got to. Uh, so I said, look, I'll, I'll, I'll do. I'll do what I can. I'll, I'll I'll reach out and here you are. So it's partly down to Katie that I'm talking to you. Uh, Kate Lester, thank you so much. She's been a huge fan, not only not only for Van Helsing, but she just really supports shows that she loves, especially on Twitter. And she's she's a beautiful hearted person, and she she's uh, she's awesome. So I thank her for that. She's a great <laughs> fan. So I'm a late comer to Van Helsing. So currently, I, I don't want to give too much away because you know I want to encourage everyone to watch it because. I'm halfway through season three, and I, I, I've got to say, you you play Ju Julius, and in the first season, you know you're this evil baby drinking vampire <laughs> that literally you you couldn't be hated more. Um, and then in season two, you take a, a, a you know an enormous turn. Um, how hard is it for an actor to play a certain character for one season, as extreme as Julius was in season one, to play julius in season two where it's a complete polar opposite it, it honestly when i first read the script and I, I was first offered the role i was excited you know i love playing i don't i don't call them bad guys i just call them uh characters that will go that much further than anybody else yeah because there has to be you know regardless of how bad they are they they have to be doing it for something and um and it always and i i always feel like it comes from a source of love either not having love or or looking or it's looking. so it was so much fun playing first season julie vampire julius and outside of that like when we yell cut and we're hanging out i just i, I i'm a very i'm very much a people person i love interacting and i love 
um, you know, having a great time. And I think the writers and the creators saw that and they thought that there would be an interesting turn. So when the turn happened, I was ecstatic because I rarely get to play those type of characters. So for me, um, it was really about, you know, how, how can I connect human Julius with uh, vampire Julius? And again, it was the love. It was, you know, he's trying for redemption. He's trying to right all his wrongs. And to me, that's you just go that much further as anybody else would to make everything right, just like he would do it. Vampire Julius would do on his side. So for me, it was it was it was pretty great to be able to have one character go from extreme to extreme. It was a gift by the writers and and everyone at Van Helsing, and I, I to this day I appreciate it. And what a great backstory you've got because you know Julius uh, was was a boxer. I mean, what what input did you have in your own character? Because in in one of the scenes you mention a boxer, Max Beer, and I thought to myself. Do you know what? That rings a bell. So I went straight on Google and he was an actual boxer in 1936, I think, around the 30s. I mean, did you have any input on your character at that stage uh, within the season? Yeah, it was it was great because the writers are so collaborative and, you know, they 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 hear some stuff and they go, oh, interesting. And then they they go to work and do what they do best and they write great stories. And they knew that I came from a boxing background. And I and I always said it would be really awesome because it's such a primitive sport that if you go back to 1936, you know, when 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 Julius was made into a vampire, it would be great that, you know, he was boxing. And so they really helped. And I'm a mama's boy. And they know that my, I'm a mama's boy. My mom's <laughs> my best friend. So they wrote that kind of thing in a very, very beautiful way. So they they were great with collaborating and just taking ideas. And, and the way I like to come about it, I, you know, I, I'm not married to anything. I love I love like almost like throwing the spaghetti on the wall and see what sticks. And, you know, if me boxing stuck with them, then great. If it didn't and was something else, then totally great. But at least I get to... I get to, you know, have have the freedom because of who they are as as producers to to hear me out. So and they and they ran with it, which uh, uh, again ecstatic. <laughs> and looking back on your time on Van Helsing, what is the fondest memory that you've got? Because it's a great cast. Um, it seems that you 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 know you've got lifelong friends from from that show. Um, what's your fondest memory of working on Van Helsing? Well, it's so it's so trippy because you know, for instance, Rakia, who plays Doc, we're doing a project together, oh, because, just from that friendship. And Missy, who just had a baby, who's amazing, who played Scarlet, she, her and I became really tight friends. And when she it, when she was on the show and we were working together, she, it was just a joy. The thing that I take away the most is the crew, and all the other creatives and the and the cast is that it became it literally became this family. It was like going to work every day. Everyone was so happy to see each other and just work. Um, I can't really think of one specific thing except uh, how much of a family we became. Uh, The the one thing is the practical jokes me and Jen Kaminsky, our our head of the makeup department, would always have practical jokes that we would always put on Instagram. And so that's always been fun. But um, I just I just love the fact that everyone is so tight and, and wants everyone else to succeed. And after season one, um, did you miss being a vampire? Did you miss all the makeup and 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 everything like that? I'm, I'm telling you, like 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 when I, that straw through that boy's back that I was sipping. And then I toss them aside like that. All that kind of stuff is hilarious to me. So <laughs> to be able to do that and have like this little vampire dog and and scream at the top of my lungs, all that stuff is super fun. So, yeah, I do miss it. Um, but I really do love, love what Julius has become and what they've written for Julius and what we've been able to do. And, and I, I mean... I tell these I tell people all the time like I've I've been in the business for for quite a while and and Van Helsing is the show that made me and yeah. I will always have I will always have a, a a place in my heart for it because I wouldn't be doing half the things that I'm doing right now if it wasn't for Van Helsing. That's awesome. And then uh, move, moving on from Van, Van Helsing, recently I watched a movie and I didn't realize it had been out for a while. Uh, Freaks. 
Um, oh yeah, which is an awesome movie. Literally Isn't it fantastic. I started watching it. I won't give too much away, but I started watching it and I was trying to figure out, I'm the type of person that I'll watch a film and I'll try and figure out two steps ahead what's going to happen. And, you know, there were bits in the movie that I was thinking, why is that happening? And then all of a sudden it came together and what an amazing movie. I mean, it's it's it's, it's got a buzz about it on online at the moment. Uh, mm-hmm. It's a bit like the Shawshank Redemption. Do you know what I mean? It was sort of, right. you know, people didn't really watch it when it came out, but now it's getting a cult following. Um, and obviously, I won't give too much away of your character and what you do in it because um, literally, it's just amazing. It really is. Was it, <laughs> were, were, was it fun to work on? Oh my god! Like I, I've worked with Zach. Uh, they were co-directed by Adam Stein and Zach Lepofsky and. And Zach, I've worked with before on on the Dead Rising film, and um, he's just a he's a phenomenal dude. So he offered me to be be in it. I read the script and I was like, oh my god, if you can come, if if you can come cl- like half as close to what the script is when we shoot it, it's it, it's going to be such a fun ride. And um, and when we were shooting it, it was great because you know it was it was a low budget indie, and but we got Bruce Stern and Emile Hirsch, which are fantastic. Grace Park. And a really great cast, and and um, it was so fun to shoot. But there was a lot of things out of context where I didn't know how they were going to do it. And since there's that scene where I'm, yeah, I could say this part. I won't give a spoiler <laughs> away. The scene where I'm in the attic and I'm rolling the hospital bed away, and all of a sudden I'm in a tunnel. And I was like, how are they going to do that? And I'll give this away because I thought it was awesome. They brought in a treadmill, right? So we had a treadmill in the attic where i was just walking and pretending to push with the whole back like as as this attic and then when we did go to the 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 tunnels i continued that walk on in the normal tunnel and i just thought that was just brilliant that you guys thought of bringing a treadmill in here to kind of (laughs) marry the two scenes i'm not going to give anything else away but um, it's it was a joy to shoot and it was such a fun character and how amazing is that young girl that's in it she's just absolutely i mean Chloe. i'm not how i'm not sure how old she is but i've i've, I've she was seven or eight at the time really because i've got a isn't that remarkable i've got a six-year-old girl and I, you know i've got a job on my hands trying to get her to tidy up after herself never mind act in such a way but it just shows that you say a low budget indie film and it just shows it's not about the money. It's about the quality of the writing, quality of the directing, quality of the actors. You don't need big budget, you know, studios behind you to make a masterpiece. And it's just fantastic. And then, you know, this is what I'm really excited about. On Netflix on the 25th of May, Snowpiercer. I cannot wait. The trailer literally rocked my socks off. I watched it and I had to share it with every single person I I, I, I knew. I was like, check this out. Because I'm a fan of the film uh, with Chris Evans. I haven't read any of the books. Um, I'm more of a movie guy or a TV guy. Um, But the trailer looks absolutely stunning. It really does. If you could explain a bit about the show and what it's about and what your role is in that show, if you're allowed to say uh yeah yeah i could say um so snow snow piercer takes place uh, unlike the movie it's uh seven years after the freeze and what happens is um the world was really hitting the, a global warming aspect and and so the government sent up some missiles to so to, to try to cool the earth a little bit and it ended up like going horribly wrong and wilford who, who is um the basic basically the the quote-unquote god of the train he he built this absolutely amazing 1001 car train to basically inhabit you had to buy the ticket to get on and it's usually the rich people that had the money to buy the ticket and it goes from classes and basically almost like a noah's ark type of feel that when the, the earth finally does come back to being livable we can start the population again and and the tailies had made a run for it to jump on the plane and so they ended up being in third class or in in the taily at the back of the back of the train and and then it's a, it's a struggle about classes it's a it's a struggle about humanity um within such a confined space and the writers just did a phenomenal job graham mason's the showrunner 
Um, and, and they just built this really fantastic world. And my character, he's a breachman and he basically deals with the engine and, and if there's anything wrong with outside of the train. So my character and my team, I lead a team of breachmen that are, do the dangerous job. The most dangerous job on the plane or on the train is to go outside of it and try to fix it with our full kind of gear on and, and kind of fighting the elements. So my character, uh, Bucky, uh, is, is, you know, quite light, rambunctious, um, gregarious and everyone else that finds something, um, a terribly seriously wrong with the train it's like don't and, and he's eastern european i'm he's a serbian dude and i just make it like don't worry everything will be okay you know like <laughs> i'll take care of everything so he, he 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 loves those pressure situations he loves the cold he was built to be a breachman yeah i mean the cast is absolutely phenomenal you've got jennifer connelly uh you've got uh steven Ogg that people will know from Walking Dead and 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 Grand, he, Grand, Grand Theft Auto. Amazing actor, even better person. He's such a great delight. Yeah, I saw I saw him at a convention over here in the UK and we was all waiting in this room with all the Walking Dead cast and he walks in with a speaker, blaring music. He was about 20 <laughs> yeah. minutes late. He's there dancing his way into the room and literally it just brought a smile on everyone's face. I mean, what have we got to expect from this show going forwards without spoiling anything? The trailer does set out a lot of things to expect. I mean, from from your words, you know, what's the ride going to be like? Well, it's interesting because basically, you know, it really starts at a, a, uh, a murder that has been done on the train. And they get to V Diggs, who, who used to, in in the in the outside world before the freeze. He was a detective, so he is the only one that they believe is someone that could probably solve this case. And so they pull him up from the tail, so, and then it goes from there um, to see if he can solve this murder. And then everything kind of unfolds, and the and the ride is basically, you know, people are faced with right and wrong and where do you go you know where do you decide do you decide something selfishly or do you decide something for mankind yeah. and there's so many little decisions that have have to be made throughout the show with so many different characters um and and i think that's the ride where you get to really jump into the psyche of each character and what's right and what's wrong and you see them decide or not decide so I love that aspect of the humanity of, um, of 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 making decisions for the right reasons or the wrong reasons. Yeah, I mean it's been renewed for a second season already, and it which we shot already, which is astonishing because it it got me really confused because when it was announced the second season, I was thinking wait a second, it hasn't been out yet. And I searched across the whole of the internet, just making sure I haven't missed anything. Uh, but is that because right. they're so confident on, on what the executives have seen um, going forward? I can only assume that. I have no information on that. All I know is that um, I was asked, uh, you know, yeah, we, we, shot that, we shot that second season already. So we are... I cannot wait for second season. I don't. I'm, there's so many things I could say. I, I just can't say. But second season is amazing. But I got this whole ride of the first season and the stunts on this show. Yeah. Um, Brett, Ch Brett Chen's a stunt coordinator, and he, he has done some amazing things in the action sequences and and the way they wrote it and how um, how the the a actors and the like Mickey Sumner and and um, um, Allison Wright, just they're, they're just uh, Michael Malley. There's so many amazing performances in this show that I can't wait for for their storylines to evolve. Where people go, oh my god, I love this character, or I hate this character. Um, so it, there's a lot of great stuff on this show. So uh, without giving anything away, are you going to be in season two as well? Oh no! Oh no! I've just asked like probably the wrong question. Someone's I don't now, know. Some, some, someone's that? now getting the NDA out. 
and going, yeah, uh-oh, yeah, exactly. uh-oh, someone's in trouble. We'll, uh, we'll see. <laughs> we'll, we'll see. see. We'll see. We'll have to watch watch it to find out. And I'm just absolutely exactly. super excited, and I cannot wait. And guess what? My wife's seen the trailer, and she wants to watch it. So I'm even more yeah. excited. Yes. So before we wrap up this wonderful interview, I want to get to know you a bit better. So uh, I, I've done this with a few other actors like Kim Coates, and it's worked oh, quite... Oh, yeah. Oh, do you know what? He is an absolute diamond of a guy. He really, really is. Oh. Um, so what's your most embarrassing moment? In general or on set? You choose. It's up to you. My most embarrassing moment. Okay, this is a good story. So I, I was, I, I, even though I play in a band, I'm not that great of a singer. I, I can do, I can do it in this range. And so I was asked to to be a part of the Lord of the Rings musical right. to go and audition. And they were looking for big dudes that could sing, maybe be coordinated enough to dance. I don't dance. I can box, but I don't dance. <laughs> so I'm like, hey, this will be great. I'll go out for it. So I go out and I just sing a song that's like something that I wrote with a friend that only I know how to do. And it's like a snippet of it. And they kind of went, okay. So they sent me to Toronto for a callback. And I'm now in Toronto seeing these amazing singers and dancers. And I'm like, what the fuck am I doing here? <laughs> So then, so then they called me into the room for the audition, and they asked me to sing scales. <laughs> and, and I did like three notes before I just I, I was done. And they go, "Do you want to try that again?" And I rem- I was just so embarrassed. There's like eight people on each side. Do you want to try that again? And you know, it's cracking. I know I'm never going to hit that note. And I go, "No, I think I think I'm okay." <laughs> And I just slowly walked out of the room. Everyone's looking at people that were in there were kind of giggling. I, I felt like that horrible American Idol audition is what I, what I felt like. So that was quite embarrassing. <laughs> and if you wasn't acting, what would you be doing? Oh, wow. wow. I would want to be telling stories in some way. So I'd probably be still playing playing music or 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 being, you know, a part of a boxing gym and helping kids out to learn to learn the, the, the what everything that boxing's taught me. Uh, I'd probably be in those that type of way. Yeah. And what makes you mad? What makes you really mad inside? Um, people with mean intent. Right. Okay. With with um, with with hatred inside to put on other people when they're going through something and they they make other people feel less than I hate that and when's the last time you you laughed out loud oh i i watched a film called (laughs) i watched the and i I don't remember last time i laughed out loud during a film and there's a film called um somebody mary barry and a buddy of mine tyler labine is in it and i had no idea what i didn't even know he did that movie i just saw it on prime on amazon prime and i went oh let's check this out and his character in the first half of the movie had me crying because he's the guy that says all the inappropriate thing in a, in a circle of friends. Yeah. And and that guy is always called a Barry. So everyone has a circle of friends and the guy that embarrasses everybody or doesn't have a filter, he's, he's named a Barry. So everyone has a <laughs> Barry in their, in their group. And he plays this character flawlessly. And I was laughing my ass off. <laughs> So I think I'm I'm definitely a berry then, because uh, yeah, I definitely the, haven't got a filter. The berry, huh? <laughs> so you're so uh, we've got to know you a bit better. We've got to know about Snowpiercer um, and obviously Van Elsen. For all those fans out there, um, with lockdown, what are you doing to keep busy? Because I know that there is a project that you've you've shared on Instagram, which sounds really interesting. A thriller with 92 members of cast, which is going to be shot virtually. Um, and it's Enderby Entertainment. Is that correct? Pardon me. What? Yeah, Enderby Entertainment yeah. are the producers. The, the film's called Ninety Two, and it's uh, basically it's you know six people, six countries, sixty minutes to save the world. 
So, and so I got it completely wrong because I thought it was nice two members of cast, which obviously well, would have been so hard virtually. So it's six members, and it's called ninety two. <laughs> And you get to figure out why it's called 92 when you watch the film, but it's all done, you know, through a webcam, iPhone, security cameras, FaceTime, and, uh, and it's all done virtually. Like, you know, we're shooting all over the world. We're literally shooting, like seriously shooting in six different countries. And the team, the DOP, the director, the producers are all on a Scott, all on a zoom and you get to see them all. And that's how we, we do the acting with them watching it there and giving notes and and it's never been done before um we've gotten we've we've done some amazing things already and the whole point is to be able to shoot this quickly and get it out before lockdown is complete so yeah. uh, it's a it's a it's a great ambitious move by enderby enderby films and enderby entertainment but the thing is um rick dugdale who's the brainchild of this he was like they have like about 10 movies three tv series ready to go but we can't do anything so he was like well i still got my team everybody's waiting like in their houses why don't we just do a movie virtually and see keep keep busy keep things sharp and i was fortunate enough to be asked to be a part of it and and uh it's pretty exciting so i've been keeping busy with that and i'm building i'm i'm, I'm with a team that wants to build a film studio in my hometown in canada uh winnipeg manitoba um and and that's what we're working towards too so we're on a bunch of zoom calls and instagram and, and uh skype calls with always always meetings going so i've been luckily quite busy that's awesome and how can fans uh follow you on social media so you're on twitter you're on facebook and you're on instagram uh what are your handles for those so on twitter and instagram it's alex pawn a-l-e-k-s-p-a-u-n and my Facebook page is just Alex Ponovic fan page. That's awesome. Alex, thank you so much for, 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 for giving me a bit of your time, especially in these, these difficult times. Stay safe, stay strong, and hopefully, who knows, we might see that fight between Tyson. <laughs> me and you. Me and you will go. <laughs> definitely, <laughs> definitely. And, and, and how proud are you of Tyson Fury? Uh, yeah, very much so. I mean, to see him go from where he was to now, and he lost it for a while. He really, really did. Yeah. And he worked out. He lost all that weight. And he is very mouthy, you know. But I tell you what, he delivers. He absolutely delivers. And He delivers. And like you said, like from where he came from, yeah. like when you're – when you're born and you and, and your parents name you Tyson because they want you to be a world <laughs> champ, that's a lot of pressure. Definitely. So you kind of sit back and he did it. He, he did. did it and then he fell and then he brought himself back up. To me, it's I, I I I love the dude. I think that yeah, he is a mouthy dude, but he backs up and he's vulnerable. Um, I, I think you guys have an amazing champion. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you very much. And Canada's got yeah. an amazing actor in yourself. Um, oh, I like that. <laughs> Alex, thank you so much. Look after yourself and stay safe. And you know what? I'm looking forward to Snowpiercer. I can't wait. Take care, brother. You've been listening to Be More Super, the podcast. It was kind of a crazy, fun experience. I love the show, guys. You're awesome. Listen, my whole family loves it, man. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to hit the subscribe button and share with your super friends. My world, let me talk.